Good evening, church family. And to all of our guests, you're our honored guest tonight. We're so glad to have you. I appreciate your kind comments about the lesson this morning. You really can't do bad when you're preaching the Sermon on the Mount. It's the greatest sermon ever preached. And you see why those Beatitudes are such a part of what our lives need to be today. Now, tonight, we are in a series of studies from the Old Testament. We're going through each book of the Old Testament and seeing Jesus in them. In Romans 15 and verse 4, the Bible says the Old Testament was written for our learning, that through patience and comfort in those scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, we might have hope. And in John 5 and verse 39, Jesus told the crowd that day, he says, search the scriptures. All they had was the Old Testament. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. They're all about me. Every book in the Bible is about Jesus. And so last week we looked at Genesis. And Genesis we called Jesus in Genesis. We saw, first of all, the breakdown of the book. Now the breakdown, the, you might say the outline, can be remembered by using hand gestures. This is Billy Stevens' favorite part of our lesson. Now, when we do this, we use our hand gestures. You all ready for your hands now? If you weren't here last week, let me show you. Genesis is four great events and four great personalities. The four great events are creation. So take your hands and make the world. Creation, and then the fall, and then the flood. Make that water ripple. The flood, and then the creation of nations. Okay, we got that. That's the first 11 chapters of Genesis. The rest of the book is four great personalities, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, all together. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Now, that's your book of Genesis in a nutshell. But now every one of those segments is about Jesus. For instance, the creation, Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus is the, one of the Godhead. And by, in fact, John chapter 1 Verses 1 to 3 says that Jesus made all things. Colossians 1, 16 and 17 says he made everything. So he's a creator. Then the fall. As soon as man fell, when Jesus came down to, to find Adam and Eve, the first thing he did before he ever gave any punishment was a promise that Jesus was coming. Genesis 3, 15. And then we have the flood. And, of course, Christ is all about the flood because God telling Noah to build the ark, and the Bible says Noah obeyed God. In 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says, as Noah saved his family by building the ark through obedience of faith, the same way baptism saves us. It's not taking a bath. If someone would drop in and see somebody being baptized, might think it's going on. No. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. It's doing what God said. It's obeying God like Noah did through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's all about Jesus. And then we saw the creation of nations, Tower of Babel. We saw that God, according to Nehemiah chapter 1, we have a God who scatters, we don't follow him, and he gathers when you do. He scattered them because of their disobedience, but the Bible tells us in heaven, people from all nations will be gathered together around his throne to sing praises unto him. It's all about Jesus. Abraham. It was Abraham that had the promise, if he be faithful to God, through his seed would come to Christ. Isaac was the one who was offered as a sacrifice, remember? But he wasn't offered. God stopped Abraham's hand. To be a visual aid, he says, with your faith, you're going to give your son, but I am going to give mine. Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. And Jacob had that dream, you remember, of the ladder with the angels going up and down. And Jesus told Nathanael in John 1, 51, I am Jacob's ladder. I'm the connection between a man and his God. And Joseph, Jesus and Joseph has so many parallels. That young man really mirrored Jesus. That's what, that was last week's lesson. Now, Exodus, Jesus and Exodus, it really, Exodus is a, just a very close continuation of the story, the narrative. Joseph dies, the last chapter of Genesis, and we just read the opening of Exodus, where Joseph now, being dead, a new Pharaoh comes to Egypt who doesn't know Joseph. Now, you remember why the children of Israel are in Egypt. 
In Genesis, it was a famine. Joseph has now been raised the second power in the whole country, the whole nation. And the brothers come down for food, and long story short, brings all of God's people eventually to the land of Egypt. And they were to live in the land of Goshen, the best pe property they had there in Egypt. So they were there, but now that's not God's plan. God's plan was for them to nurture there and become a great nation, which they did, but to get them to the promised land. He promised Abraham. They don't want to leave. Would you want to leave the land of Goshen? Well, guess what happens? A new Pharaoh comes to power who does not see Joseph as a friend or his people as friends, but potential enemy. So he makes their life slavery, and he makes their life miserable, and even tries to kill the, the babies, the Jewish baby boys, have them thrown to the Nile River. So these people who really like living in Egypt now want to leave. The word exodus means leaving. Just like Genesis means beginning. Everything that began, began in Genesis. Exodus is all about leaving. You ever want to leave someplace? Well, these folks want to leave in the worst way. And you know why? We're going to look at the book of Exodus tonight by using the words already there. By the way, you can see leaving in the word Exodus. Exit. There's a red sign right there. It says exit. What does that mean? Leave. Okay. So we're going to use the letters exit to define and to outline the book of Exodus. First of all, the E in Exodus stands for enslaved. Again, I mentioned now the people are enslaved. And slavery in the Bible, bondage in the Bible, is synonymous with what sin does to us. I want you to open your Bible to Exodus now, the book of Exodus. And look with me as we look at uh, chapter 1 of the Exodus. And notice verse 14. And they made their lives, the Egyptians, to the Israelites, bitter with hard bondage and mortar and in brick, and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Even it was hard work to begin with, they made it even harder for them. All right? Now let's turn to the uh, second chapter in verse 23. And it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage, and they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. They're crying out for delivery from this bondage. There's so many people in our world tonight who are in sin and they're trying to find their way out. And they're crying out to God for somebody to tell them about the way out, about Jesus, about salvation. They don't know that. But that's what they're crying out for. Now, I want you to keep your marker in Exodus, but go over to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4, the New Testament, way back in the New Testament, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, there it is. Galatians chapter 4, and look at verse 3. As Paul's talking about this synonymous with sin and bondage, he says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. So today people are crying out for deliverance. Now, back in this day, after 400 years of bondage, thank you, Dylan, a baby is born. Okay? Thank you. And the baby is born at a time that could be the worst possible time. It's the time when they were taking little boy, boy babies and throwing them in the Nile River. But these parents were not going to let that happen. They were faithful parents, Hebrews 11 tells us. And so they finally couldn't hide the baby anymore, so they put him into a basket and put the basket in the Nile River. And it, had, it was waterproof, so it could float. And God had this planned out and told him what, what to do. And here comes the Pharaoh's daughter, and she opens the basket, and the baby starts crying, and any woman's going to say, Aww. And she wants to keep the baby because there's no mama around. Again, the plan here comes this girl out of the bulrushes. It's really Moses' sister, Miriam. And she says, I can find a Jewish woman to take care of that baby for you. She says, go get her. Of course, it's his own mama. But did you realize that it was the Pharaoh's daughter that named that baby? Moses. It means taken from the water. 
And so as this boy is being raised, I always think about this, God's providence. He thinks, he says, he's, you see him on the throne one day saying, I've got these Israelites right under my thumb. Now, where's my grandson Moses? The deliverer of God's people were right in front of him, and he didn't realize it. Well, when he became of age, the Bible says Mo Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter anymore. He wanted to relate himself with the people of God, who were now slaves. So one day when he saw a taskmaster beating up on a slave, he's going to show his allegiance and try to stop that taskmaster. And in their struggle, he actually killed him. He thought that would show his allegiance to these people, but instead they said, they thought he was some kind of murderer. Are you going to kill us now? And so Moses had to leave. It's all God's plan. In Acts chapter 7, the Bible says that Moses was learned in all the ways of the Egyptians. And folks, today we still don't know that wisdom. We're finding Egyptian mummies that have been embalmed and look like they just died yesterday. And they've been dead for thousands of years. We don't know how to do that today. They did in those days. They were highly intelligent people. But Moses need also be toughened. So he went out to the desert for 40 years. And he, he, he traveled in the very area he's going to be leading these children of Israel. In fact, when he had that burning bush calling, that was on Mount Sinai. And when he got that calling, the bush or God says, you'll come back to this mountain one day. I want you to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. What's he doing? Moses is God's deliverer. God says, I've heard their cries. I've seen their affliction. Moses, go. But too many of us are like Moses. We say, not me. Who am I? What can I do? But God says, I need you to go. But when Jesus was asked to go, he went without any kind of argument or excuse. But the Bible says, turn over now to Deuteronomy chapter 18 for a minute. Deuteronomy chapter 18. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses, now at the end of his life, in fact, I'm talking about Moses tonight because he is the author of the next four books. Ex well, actually, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, all written by Moses. But in Deuteronomy chapter 18, and look at verse 15 with me. Moses is talking, the Lord talking through Moses. And Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me, unto him you shall hearken. Verse 15. Now go to verse 18. I'll raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto you, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. It shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. Who is this prophet coming like unto Moses? Well, if you can't guess by now, let me show you. Go over now to the book of Acts in the New Testament, the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 3, Stephen, oh, excuse me, actually here, uh, yes, um, Peter is preaching. And Peter says in verse 28 of Acts chapter uh, 3, Acts 3 and verse 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise unto you from your brethren, like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that even every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. You are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your fathers, saying to Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindred of the earth be blessed. That's Jesus. Unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turn away every one of you from his iniquities. Jesus is that one that Moses is talking about. So it's, he's all in this Old Testament concept. He is the redeemer. Now, how is he going to redeem them? He tries to get them out of bondage. And so in chapter 5 and verse 1, Moses goes down. God finally gets him to go down. And he goes before Pharaoh and he tells Pharaoh, let my people go. You're not going to believe this. But in verse 2 of that text, Pharaoh says, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? You should never ask that question. Who is God that I should obey him? Because God gave him a 10-lesson correspondence course about who God is called the plagues. Okay? Now, 
I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I don't know how many of you know what the ten plagues are. If I ask you without looking at the screen, what are the ten plagues? I don't know if you know them in order, but the next three minutes from now, you're going to know them all. You're going to know even them in order, and you're going to know a little bit about them. And here it is. It's in a very strange story, but the stranger the better because then you remember it better. Okay? What do you call it when, let's say, a frog jumps on a road and he's run over? What do you call that on the road? Roadkill. Okay. It's blood. Okay? That's your first plague when he turned the water into blood because those children were thrown in the Nile River and to remind them of that. But blood is your first one. Okay? Now here come some more frogs on the road. You got some more roadkill. The second plague was the frogs. And of course, in Egypt, frogs were a god. And God was showing who really God is. But here's your frogs. And then you have, after a while, roadkill in the heat of the day, you got lice on them. Then you have flies on them. You got four down now blood, frog, lice, flies. All together. Frog, I mean, blood, frogs, lice, flies. Okay. Then you got, moo, here comes a cow. God had them, the uh, Egyptian cattle killed. This particular cow steps on the roadkill. Guess what happens to his foot? He gets a what? A boil. You got the next two, cattle and the boil. He gets a boil on his foot. So he goes to the barn and he puts his foot in a pail of water. What do you call water that's frozen coming from the sky? Pale or hail? Okay, so we got hail. We got that one. As he's cooling his foot, here comes the locusts into the barn. There's so many of them that it just darkens. Everything is pitch dark. You got the next ones locusts and darkness. And it's so bad, the cow has a heart attack and he falls over dead. The death of the first barn. I mean, firstborn. You got it? Okay, now I thought you, I told you it was silly. Okay, here we go. What's the first plague? Second one. Third one. Fourth one. Next one. Excuse me. Cattle. Next one. Okay, boils. Next one. Hail. Next one. Locust. Next one. Darkness. Last one. See, I told you you remember that. Isn't that wonderful? So now you can tell your friends. If you, again, if you're on Jeopardy, you might win a prize. Who knows? All right. But that, those were actually for a purpose. Because each time Moses is trying to say, let my people go. And he kept saying, no. Who is the Lord? I shall obey his voice. By the 10th plague, everybody knew who God was. In fact, the 10th plague, God told the children of Israel, not a death angel. That's not what the Bible says. The Lord, that's Jesus, the Lord is coming tonight. And you put the blood of the lamb on your doorpost and he will pass over your house that has the blood of the lamb. But take the firstborn of the Egyptians. The Bible tells us in John 1, 29, and also in verse 36, when Jesus came to John the Baptist to be baptized of him as our example, what did John call him? the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And in 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, Paul says Jesus is our Passover. This is all in Exodus now, okay? All right, that's the E, enslaved. Now we're coming out of Egypt. And I don't know if I can even get it in my mind's eye, and, and a lot of different speculation. We're talking about thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of people, a large group of people leaving Egypt. Now, I can imagine every Herald newspaper and every little hamlet had front page, Exodus. Thousands of people leave Egypt. Now, don't you know they're all asking, why did you let them go, Pharaoh? Because now Pharaoh, now the people of Egypt, now the children of Israel, and now even Moses knows that God is God. With my mighty hand, and my outstretched arm. And when you read the rest of your Old Testament, whenever they refer to the power of God or the God of Israel, he's always referred to as the God of the Exodus. There is no other way to explain this. 
other than God is a powerful God. They all leave Egypt. But you know what happens. They get to the Red Sea. You've got the Red Sea in front of you. You've got all these soldiers behind you. And the people say, we should have stayed in Egypt. Oh, people are so fickle. But anyway, Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, Christ is our Redeemer. Now, this is how he's going to save us. And the waters of the Red Sea part. And it's just dry land. And the people are told to walk across on dry land, and they do. And they have the cloud over them, and they have the sea on board both sides of them. They get over on the other side. Here comes the army of Egypt trying to get them back. They get right in the middle, and God brings the waters back. On the other side, the children of Israel sing the song of Moses. See, you have to be God to know this because God knew what he was going to do later on. And here's a picture of what's going on later on. The picture is this, that when you and I are baptized into Christ, all of our sins, our past, our slavery is washed away. And we have a whole new life now. Romans 6 and verse 4 says we rise to walk in a newness of life. And Revelation says when we get to heaven, we're going to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. Victory, deliverance. But if you don't believe me, Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Paul says that the children of Israel were baptized unto Moses, under the cloud and in the sea. There's your picture of God's wonderful plan for us. The exodus. He is our salvation. Now, on the other side, here's a little, I don't know if you can see from where you're sitting here, but I call them my two test tubes here. But on would be your, I guess it would be your left. On your left, two big bubbles there. The first bubble on top is the Egyptians in bondage. The bottom bubble is, is us in sin. And then the little tube is the baptism of the children of Israel and our baptism. The next bubble is their wilderness wanderings. And right now we're called strangers and pilgrims on the earth as we go through this world together. On top, the next little tube there is the Jordan River, which you'll see in the book of Joshua, as they go to finally the promised land, the last bubble. And we call crossing the Jordan death until we get to the Hadean world and finally heaven or hell. But that's your picture that God had in his mind a long time ago. The I is Mount Sinai, okay? Mount Sinai. We finally got to Mount Sinai. Jesus is the Redeemer. Jesus is the Deliverer. Jesus here shows himself to be the sustainer taking care of them and also their lawgiver. Just ask Moses. And Moses goes up to receive the Ten Commandments and the law. Now, how many of you know the Ten Commandments? Would you know them in order? Well, in about three minutes, you're going to know them too. Okay? And here we go. Now, the Ten Commandments are called the chief commandments of the law. So our chieftain, our big chief, our Indian chief, his name is No Make Take Keep. That's his name. All together. No Make Take Keep. That's your first four commandments. This is a kind of a shortened version of it. But here we go. Take your finger. Thou shalt have no, no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Number one. Number two, make. You shall not make any graven image. You don't make any graven image of God. Number three, you don't take. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Yes, you don't take. Put it over your mouth. You don't take the name of the Lord our God in vain. And folks, write that one right there. Oh, it's being broken every day in every way. You can hardly watch anything on television, hardly listen to anybody talking in your workplace or at school without, oh, my God, this, oh, my God, that, Jesus, this, Jesus. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. God said that. Don't do that, okay? Don't take my name in vain, number three. Number four, you take your hands together because you're going to keep it, the four fingers, keep the Sabbath day. Keep the Sabbath day. All right, what's the first commandment? 
Oh, you're cheating. Here we go. Okay. What's the first commandment? The gods before me. Second one? Don't make any graven images. Third one? Don't take the name of the Lord God in vain. Number four? Keep the Sabbath day. All right, good. You weren't cheating. Number five. Number five, you take your hand like this, because you've got five fingers, and you're saluting your mother and father. Honor your father and mother. One time I was doing this with really little bitty kids, and one little kid says, honor your mother and pitter, or something like that. Now, honor your mother and father. But it's honor your father and mother. Honor your father and mother. You got that? Five. All right. Number six, you got two here now. And as you put this hand over here, you can let your thumb kind of help you be a rest, but here it is. Don't kill. Don't kill. You got that? Honor your father and mother. Don't kill. Number seven is, you put your, over your eyes, don't commit adultery. Don't commit adultery. <laughs> one parent told me one time their child was in our Mother's Morning Out program, I think, or, or maybe it was the, other, the school that we used to be here. And... Uh, she was going around, and she was saying, don't commit adultery. Sunday morning, don't commit adultery. Don't commit adultery. And her mom and dad looking at each other. So it can teach everybody this. Don't commit adultery, okay? Don't commit adultery. All right, that's number seven. Number eight is don't kill. Well, no, don't steal. Don't steal. Read your, read your script, Steve. Don't steal. Don't steal, okay? So here we go. Honor your father and mother. Don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal. Okay. And then, number nine, don't lie. You got nine fingers, don't lie. Put it over your mouth. Don't lie. Don't lie. Don't bear false witness, what the Bible says. Don't lie. And number ten, how do you do covet? Well, take your hands and push your face to the side. Don't want other people's things. Don't want other people's things. That's coveting. All right, I know you know these now. Ten Commandments, without any hands. First one, no other gods before me. Second commandment, don't make any graven images. Good. Number three, don't take the name of the Lord your God. Now, in your mind, you're doing all these, I know, but you can see it now. Number four, keep the Sabbath day. Number five, honor your father and mother. Good. Number six, don't kill. Number seven, don't commit adultery. Number eight, don't steal. Number nine, don't lie. And number ten, now you got the Ten Commandments. See what you can learn on Sunday night? I mean, it's amazing. But now we're, we see the law from God. And we have the Ten Commandments. The T in Exodus is the tabernacle. Now, here's one. If I was on Jeopardy and they said, which book in the Old Testament has the instructions on how to build the worship facility for the children of Israel? I would guess Leviticus, which we'll see next week, is the worship book of the Old Testament. But that's not right. Exodus. You can win a prize here. Exodus, would you have the instructions on how to build the tabernacle? And Jesus is our high priest. And they're all about the tabernacle. This is their portable church building. This is where they travel and they worship God together through the wilderness wanderings. And this is a diagram of that. Notice how God works now. If you're coming in to the courtyard, the very little black little box there is the altar of burnt offerings, which we know is if we're going to come to Jesus, we've got to give ourselves as a living sacrifice to him. We've got to repent of our sins. And then you go over that, it's like a bird bath, a little round thing. It's called a laver. It's where the priest would wash before they go in to the holy place. You're baptized. You're washed away from your sins. And then you can walk into what's called the holy place. This is the first compartment. Now, only the priest can go in there. But when you're baptized into Christ, today, you are a part of his priesthood. So you go in there, and there are three symbols there. you got your menorah which means that we're the light of the world, the candlestick, we're the light of the world. You have the table of showbread, the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. And we have the altar of incense, and the Revelation letter calls it our prayers. It's what we do as God's people. But only the high priest 
could go through the most holy, a holy place to the most holy place, going through a curtain one time a year with the blood of the bull, and he would sprinkle it on a little box that was in that compartment called the Ark of the Covenant. And it looked like a coffin would have two angels called cherubim with their wings pointed toward each other and the space between where those two tips of wings would be this little space here is called the mercy seat where God supposedly dwells so here it is this is where you're coming to the presence of God for the sins of the people well who does that for us today Jesus his blood for our sins he's our high priest and does that and going back one time to show you that how beautiful this is when Jesus died upon the cross, the Bible says that the curtain in the temple, which it was, the temple was built just like the tabernacle, but this, is, this was a fixed building, but the curtain, like two giant hands, tore it in half from top to bottom, which means no more separation. Now we don't need men high priests. We have our high priest. We can go to him anytime we want to, right in the most holy place, to pray to God talk to him face to face. Isn't that wonderful? Again, that's all in the book of Exodus. One more thought. Moses and Jesus are a type of each other. We already saw that. They were leaders like prophets, priests, and kings. They were leaders of their people, of their day. And we're going to see in the book of Joshua that when you did something wrong, somebody would come to your rescue or come to your defense or come to stand for you was called a kinsman redeemer. Kinsman mean the closest kin to you to help you, to redeem you, to, to speak up for you. Well, in the Old Testament, Moses was their kinsman redeemer. Christ is our kinsman redeemer today. In Moses' day, his infancy was endangered. So was Jesus, you remember, in Bethlehem. They both renounced their power and wealth. He could have remained, Moses, in Egypt and been the son of Pharaoh's daughter, but he refused it to be part of God's people. And, of course, Jesus, Philippians 2, being equal with God, did not think that jealousy grasped, but he humbled himself and came to be a man to die for us. And then they're all, both of them are deliverers, lawgivers, and mentors. Do you see now that when you're studying the Old Testament, it is history, but it's really his story. Tonight, if you're looking for Jesus, he's been looking for you for a long time. You can come forward tonight and give me your hand and God your heart, and we'll baptize you into Christ. Have all your sins washed away. Become a New Testament Christian and live the Christian life. If you've wandered away from your first love, you can come back tonight. We'll pray with you and for you as New Testament Christians to get on this journey. This whole book of Exodus is about journeying. We're, we're starting tonight journeying. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Journeying together with God. And we can do that because Jesus is right there. Will you come?